podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to Welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. To Welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversations that satisfy your curious mind. This is your brain on drugs. Remember those commercials? I love those things with the eggs cracking. Depending on how old you are, they may be a little before your time. But today we are talking about your brain on supplements, sort of. These things called nootropics. And it's really, we get a good sense of what they are in the episode. So I'm going to let our guests talk about them. We also cover some great things. We really go into neurofeedback, what an EEG is, how you can study brain wavelengths, and really what is at the frontier of discovering the brain. We also talk about mindfulness, meditation, how to reduce stress, how to deal with the stress so that your brain stays strong. And then lastly, we do touch on supplements for basically being superhuman, for retaining more, thinking quicker, learning. Now, just to note, our guest this week is an advisor for this company, and the name of the company is True Brain. But I thought it'd be a really interesting interview, and I think it would cover a lot of things that are in the news these days. And he is an advisor to them. He also does a bunch of other things. So we're interviewing Dr. Andrew Hill. Dr. Hill received his PhD in cognitive neuroscience from UCLA. He studies how attention operates in the brain. He currently lectures for the undergraduate education initiatives program at UCLA, teaching a course, Sequence Gerontology and the Neuroscience of Healthy Brain Aging. He is also the founder of the Alternatives Brain Institute. ABI has a mission to provide integrated brain and mind services to meet the changing needs of individuals throughout their lives. They look at behavioral health, alternative methods other than drugs to really get the most out of your brain to help with things such as stress, addiction, and a lot of the afflictions we deal with today. Make sure you head on over to smartpeoplepodcast.com. Sign up for our newsletter right there. We love connecting with you. We love hearing from you. Don't forget our Amazon banner. And last but not least, if you enjoy the show, please leave a comment and rating on iTunes. We greatly Greatly, greatly appreciate it. Here is our interview on your brain with Dr. Andrew Hill. Well, we have on the show for you, Dr. Andrew Hill. I'm so excited to talk to you about really everything brain, this this huge organ that just decides everything we do on a daily basis, yet we know very little about. I'm, I'm excited to talk to you. Thanks for being on the show. My pleasure, Chris. Thanks for having us. So first things first, let's get a little bit of idea about your background. I know you have been studying this for a long time. You're, you're doing a bunch of different things. You founded Alternatives. You're an advisor at Think Drinks. Give us a little bit about your background and how you got into this. Sure. So um, I got my uh, PhD at UCLA a few years ago um, in cognitive neuroscience, uh, a division of psychology that focuses on the intersection of mind and brain, essentially, or how the brain produces the mind, the experience of mind, features of cognition like attention and sleep and emotion. Uh, that's the sort of field I, I work in. And I, I uh, took a very operational approach. Where, you know, I wanted to work with hands-on and changing people's lives. I've, I've worked in mental health and human services uh, as well as high tech for, you know, off and on for most of my life. And so I um, studied how to assess attention and train the brain using neurofeedback and ended up getting into areas studying lateralized attention, how attention operates in each hemisphere of the brain separately, and did a few double-blind, placebo-controlled uh, investigations of neurofeedback techniques and tried to figure out a bit more about how it works. And, you know, this was a pretty rigorous PhD program, took many years, and I started to get a little bit overwhelmed in terms of workload and teaching and research and everything else, as you might imagine. And along that time, I tried going back on Adderall. I tried Adderall as a, as a teenager or a, a young adult, rather, and it worked okay. Um, tried it again as a as an adult in, 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 in grad school, and it didn't work real well at all, and I had a lot of side effects. So I started looking for other things that might be useful to support you know a high level of output. 
And I, I got into this, these, these compounds called nootropics, which are analogous to vigilance-promoting drugs like Adderall or Ritalin. But the, the difference is uh, nootropics aren't necessarily used to remediate a specific problem. They're used to enhance existing cognition. Throughout the, the, the grad school ordeal, I was refining my own uh, understanding and also experience with nootropics and, and sort of self-experimenting and de- designing combinations and blends of different uh, compounds. And, you know, found, a, found a, a blend that worked pretty well for me and for friends and family. And a, a couple years after, uh, actually about a year after I got my PhD, I, I met Chris Thompson, who was just launching uh, a company that he wanted to focus on essentially neurotech, but neurotech from a, an unusual angle. He wanted to try to bring nootropics to a wider audience. So we, we, we put our heads together and brought in a few more people from uh, Duke and UCLA and, and other schools and um, brainstormed a few products. And TrueBrain 1.0 was born, which is a subscription uh, nootropic service, if you will, that delivers um, a nootropic supply to your door, uh, you know, curated chosen ingredients based on what we can figure out is, is a good blend for most people. So I was doing that on one side. And on the other side, I, I have been working in alternatives, behavioral health, which is a program uh, I'm one of three partners. Uh, we started a company literally trying to bring alternative approaches, alternative options to people in a couple different areas of behavioral health. Um, and I do a lot of quantitative EEG or brain mapping and neurofeedback to help change their brain. Uh, we also teach them to meditate and do mindfulness instruction ongoing with them. Uh, so, you know, I'm sort of have my hand in a lot of pies, uh, as it were. Uh, and, um, and here we are about two years into both these companies, and True Brain is doing well, and Alternatives is uh, we're growing into our third location in Southern California uh, in the next couple of months. And we will, um, you know, we're, all, these, all these efforts are designed to bring optimum performance. All of those things are things I don't want to jump into at some point on this interview. I want to go back to one of the first things you said, though, and and create this foundation because it was really interesting. And although after you said it, it makes a lot of sense. I don't think oftentimes we think of the mind and the brain as separate things. And I really like the way you mentioned the brain and how it guides the mind yeah. because oftentimes, you know, I've been diving into meditation and, and trying to see the mind and thoughts for what they are. Is it simply a chemical response. I always wonder if where my thoughts come from are just chemicals interacting in different ways in my brain. Well, chemicals, uh, among other things, electromagnetic waves, uh, and it's more, it's more than the individual components. It's the rhythms, it's the firing patterns, it's the dance, it's the chaotic storm, uh, you know, uh, broadly orchestrated, that is your uh, experience, that is your, your, your moment-to-moment perception of consciousness. And we see in ways that consciousness is abolished or disrupted in people or the experiences of consciousness with certain types of brain injuries or certain types of um, you know, developmental problems where there's just you know, processing issues. Um, especially in things like split brain, you know, you can, you can show information stream to people that don't get to the other side of the brain and the information's just not there. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of variability of course across experience, but yeah, I think you're, you're, you're getting at what is maybe, um, at least my core belief about our experience, our minds, uh, is that they are the brain. There is this complicated wetware and hardware and software, uh, up there. And it is producing the experience, producing the mind. Yeah. And the other thing is, I often wonder if you ask anybody, what do you want out of life? And they'll tell you a bunch of different things. But what I see at the core is it's really everybody wants a certain feeling. Everything we do is for a feeling, right? Uh This thing we call happiness. If happiness is really only a chemical reaction away, why don't we all just make happiness drugs and right. shoot up all day and live in the matrix, you know, in this right, little bubble right. of happiness drugs. Right. Well, well, reward or the interesting, important signal, you know, dopamine. Uh, um, we have drugs that, that hijack that. There are things like cocaine and, you know, mm. Adderall and <laughs> yeah. uh, um, all the drugs that help 
tune your 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 attention bias wide up so your your attention is really you know heightened um, or at least your vigilance is your 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 sort of wakeful alertness is um, but it's not about happiness necessarily i would argue um, you know or maslow who's the who's the king of this would argue uh, we have a hierarchy and at, at, it depends on on what is being met and what is not being met uh, before you can care about other things you don't care so much about happiness uh, in the abstract when you can't eat you care about food, you know, you care mm. about uh, a roof when it's raining. Uh, but if you have all those things, then you start caring about more abstract uh, fulfillment, if you will. And at the very higher level are things like um, self, you know, awareness and, and, and uh, development and very high level abstract concepts. And happiness is some, probably somewhere halfway down that pyramid. Um, it's not really an, a pyramid that uh, uh, Maslow has been disproven to some extent. He used to say that you had to have all levels, you know, in order. Um, and that used to be the prevailing wisdom, but but we sort of know now that you you can have uh, some self fulfillment, some wisdom, uh, and still not have your basic needs met. You know, um, but happiness, uh, you know, I'm not sure what that is. I I'm not even sure if it's real. Um, hmm. I, I I think that having uh, at least from an evolutionary imperative. Uh, biological imperative sense, you know, we, we are, our, our brains are pattern matching machines designed to minimize all the pain and danger and threat and maximize uh, gains, you know, food and sex and those kinds of things. And I do think those core drives, even though we're higher functioning creatures, I do think those core drives uh, still operate, you know, in our psychology to some extent. Um, overlaid on that is our culture and our you know, agreements about our psychology and our, and our, our, our rules to live by. But um, I do think we're sort of still primitive in many ways and the brain is just massively complex and we're able to adapt and adjust and learn and contextualize. Uh, and we have this incredible culture that you know, the brains are born into and are able to develop a, a sense of appropriate behavior and what meaning is and what information is. Uh, and a brain that's born into this probably develops a little bit differently and has different goals than a brain that was born into a cave and, you know, wasn't sure where fire came from. Have you thought about or do you have a response to the fact that now, even as opposed to perhaps a generation or two ago, mm -hmm. global conditions have, despite what a lot of people think and see on the news, gotten better, right? A lot of us have our basic needs met, probably every single person listening to this podcast, and much more so than 20, 50, 100 years ago. Life sure. expectancy, food, the availability of food and shelter. So do you think that's a lot of the reason why people are focusing more, or it seems to be focusing more on Things like mindfulness and the brain and the science behind it, because when we have those things met, we're now looking for the answer to the things on the next level. Yeah, maybe. Uh, certainly we have space, uh, many of us, to ask these kinds of questions, right? But on the other hand, uh, while many things are getting better, uh, what might not be getting better for this, this class of listener and, and myself and you who have our basic needs met and live in a very information-rich uh, world is um, responding to information, information fatigue and decision fatigue and overwhelm and trying to process slews of emails and um, a less linear you know, business environment, work, uh, workplace, you know, where you're never untethered now. Um, so I do think the demands on attention and resources are shifting, and I do think that's part of it today. Um, it's part of the uh, challenge that we're experiencing. Are we trying too hard to optimize our brains now? Because we're always looking for something, right? We're always looking to find the next thing, that, that movie Limitless. I love it. And I think if you offer it to us, we're going to take it. But I know the times in my life when I've truly optimized my brain, it's because I was doing less, not more. So it's this oh. tough this this tough place because we have all of these requirements. We have all this information. As you and I were kind of talking about prior to recording, is the amount of, of stressors put on us if we want to really make a dent in this world is immense right now. And so perhaps it's just our solution to that problem as opposed to saying, all right, I'll just take it easy and do a little bit less. Yeah, and you know, mindfulness it may be an old solution to a to a not a new problem, but a problem that is heightened by this amount of information flux that we sit in. And uh, you know, to some extent, I think that if you look at ancient Buddhist techniques, ancient Buddhist manuals on meditation, um, they read kind of like psychology text. Here is your mind. Here is how to tame it. 
uh, with repetitive instructions, um, essentially. So uh, what, we, what we can do is take these old techniques and apply them and get very real benefit. Um, you mentioned as, as we were getting ready to record that you have a, a mindfulness practice and you know, you're doing something that is at least a few thousand years old. Uh, and it probably helps in many of the same ways it helped a few thousand years ago. But we might need the help a bit more now, at least in terms of making room to think. Sadly, I completely agree. And I mean, I do. And, and so, you know, there's been a lot of attention and news around mindfulness, changing your brain, training the brain, you know, luminosity has made it very big. There's a bunch yeah. of meditation apps and you have uh, a lot of people promoting that. And I, again, I'm a huge proponent. I've recently started and I see a difference, but I can't physically see it, right? So so I can see that mentally, and sometimes I feel like it helps me. But because it's not a physical shift, as opposed to when I go to the gym and right afterwards even see that I'm a little bit bigger, it's more discouraging. And I think it's much more difficult for people to maintain that practice. From your perspective, since you technically, I think, do see it using this yeah. neurofeedback Let's yeah. talk about that. What's that look like? What's the science behind that? Is it, sure. is it really true? <laughs> is it really true? Yeah. Uh, it, um, it is. Okay. The, 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 the short answer is that neurofeedback is exceptionally well validated at this point by the research literature. Um, and it works for a wide host of things that we sort of consider problematic in human experience. Um, and those are a lot of what, you know, what I consider regulatory features of the brain. And if you can view it from a regulatory perspective and um, assess real patterns that show up in the brain, um, then you can often train them uh, by providing, you know, the, the, the brain's whole job is to adapt itself to learn to become, uh, you know, the best it can, extracting the most uh, maybe happiness out of the environment. And the way that it does that is by adjusting and adapting its, its, its behavior. And you can tap into that same process to shape the actual amount of different frequencies in the brain, you know, things we call delta, theta, alpha, beta. And we've discovered over the past 50 or 60 years that there are some gross patterns in the EEG that go along with specific challenges in function. Um, the easiest one to talk about, it's one of the best validated, is ADHD. Uh, you know, you can, with a, with a blind reading to some extent, you can do a brain map on somebody and determine, you know, what, uh, what kind of ADHD challenges they have. You know, do they have hyperactivity, impulsivity? Do they have inattention and distractibility? Uh, these are sort of different features, the, the, hyper, the, the uh, inattention versus the impulsivity or to some extent divergent features in ADHD. And you can have uh, one category, the other, or both. And from a EEG, a, a brainwave perspective, if you will, um, a spacey, distracted, kind of uh, checked out person who it's hard to get their attention, uh, their brain makes a lot of uh, alpha, a lot of idle brainwaves with their eyes open. And, and most people's brains, with your eyes open, most alpha is suppressed and you, uh, you make a lot of beta in the back of the uh, brain processing visual input. Um, in lots of places, you make these sort of faster frequencies. When you close your eyes, the visual cortex, sensory cortex, kind of goes into this alpha, this quiescent or idle mode. Um, when you open your eyes, the alpha blocks and you go back into a beta mode. And for people that are inattentive, they're stuck in this alpha, this neutral. And so just looking at someone's brain activity, you can say, okay, look, you're, you know, way out there on the curve in terms of how much alpha you make with your eyes open, that's probably something that's causing you some difficulty. Let's uh, measure the alpha that you're making moment to moment. And whenever it trends in the right direction or drops, let's, I don't know, make a Pac-Man munch some dots on a screen or a spaceship fly. And the brain naturally fluctuates. So uh, one moment it's making a little, a little more alpha, the next moment a little less. And suddenly the Pac-Man starts moving and music starts playing. And the brain looks up and goes, whoa, input, and starts paying attention. And the next moment, it fluctuates in the wrong direction, so to speak. And the input stops. You tell the computer to withhold those visual and auditory rewards when the trends go in the wrong direction. And the brain is so much a pattern matching and learning and adapting itself to the environment machine, you know, tool-using machine, that it starts to do what it can do to make more input happen. 
to some extent, this is how the brain works in general. You know, using tools, be it a pen or a pencil or a computer mouse, the brain maps those onto the motor cortex as if it's uh, an extension of your limbs almost, as if it's a part of the body. Um, and when you're learning to, to, to walk or crawl, let's say, as, as a little baby, uh, initially there's some random movement and your limbs are flailing about. And at some point, the random movement lines up with what you want. And that might be, you know, pushing yourself up uh, in the first stages of a crawl. And when you start to figure out, even non-sort of consciously, that, you know, a brain activity lined up with the behavior you wanted, your brain notices that and is able to make more of that. And that's all that's happening in neurofeedback. You know, it, it's a little abstract because you see a spaceship flying on a screen, it flies for a bit and then stops. And then flies for a bit more and then stops. Or, uh, you know, perhaps you're, you're sitting back with your eyes closed. Whenever you go into a deep relaxation state, um, you hear chimes or you hear, you know, tones. So it's, it's not meditation. It's not mindfulness. In fact, it's actually not voluntary or, or even effortful. Uh, central biofeedback, biofeedback on the central nervous system or neurofeedback is largely a non-cognitive process. You don't try. You just kind of let it happen. It's... You know, you, you show up and put your butt in the, in the neurofeedback training chair a few times a week and the process slowly and gently shapes brain activity because the brain wants to try to drive the, the, the games you're putting in front of it. That's a bit of an oversimplification, but that really is about how neurofeedback works. Sure. So I'm trying to get a better grasp on what you were saying the brain's ultimate goal is. Well, I mean, there's, there's, there's basic goals and needs, and then there's higher stuff, right? And as humans, as higher cognitive function people, uh, you know, creatures, we have different goals and, and, and values. But at some basic fundamental level, I was suggesting that we, you know, are, 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 we're driven by genetic imperatives, evolutionary imperatives. You know, we're, all of, a lot of our psychology can, to some extent, boil down to um, being evolutionarily valid. You know, we only learned and became good at doing things that made sense in terms of the species long term. Um, anything that was really counterproductive to an evol evolutionary benefit kind of left the species along the way. Uh, and so you can think about at least some aspects of psychology and neuroscience, you know, the physiological psychology, as having some evolutionary validity. You know, they have to make sense in terms of what gain they were presenting. And, uh, you know, that may, be, may have given me a bias that the brain, a lot of the jobs, if you will, of the brain is feeding you and keeping you safe and warm and happy or, or at least content and away from danger and away from stress and away from, uh, you know, uh, privation and, and uh, you know, even maybe things like loneliness and, and lack of and, and boredom, you know, mm. lack of lack of stimulation. Certainly that's true for, for even mice. You know, mice put in a boring cage, their brains are smaller and they don't thrive as well. Mice put in a rich cage full of toys and, you know, play, playful uh, opportunities um, have much more developed and rich brains and give them some friends to play with and it's even even, even healthier brain. Uh, so this is not uniquely human. This is to some extent how these, these information processing chunks we have work. I'm trying to think about, you and I discussed this, the past couple of years for me have been a departure from what I've done in the past. I've started a nonprofit, I've started my own coaching business, I've worked on this podcast, very stressful, I now operate with only two computer screens up when I'm at my desk, and I've seen a deterioration, a, a very noticeable deterioration in my attention span, in my patience, What's happening there behind the scenes if we were maybe to hook me up and do some neurofeedback? Yeah, um, I would guess if we, if we put a full head of EEG wires on you or a cap and measured your activity, uh, I'm guessing we would see a lot of uh, you know, stress markers, a lot of uh, vigilance with your eyes closed that shouldn't necessarily be there, uh, maybe a faster idle speed that is sort of wearing you out, essentially markers for, for being highly driven, stressed out, and, and lack of cognitive performance you know, might be re related to fatigue, but it may also be simply related to stress being too high, which impairs learning, impairs attention, and over the long term, will do things like make your cortex, you know, lose weight, and not in a good way. You know, you, you really want your brain to be fat, and to be thick. Uh, the cortex must remain sort of juicy and plump. Um, the good thing is, and you mentioned this before we started recording, that you have this meditation practice for the past couple of months. Uh, and that meditation will, will prevent, it will spare your brain the ravages 
of thinning that come with some aspects of stress and also come with aging. Long term, uh, meditators that ate that, that uh, sorry, uh, people that, uh, elders that have meditated for many years, their brains are not thin in the places that typically thin out when you age. Hmm. Uh, and the same is probably true of stress, although I haven't seen any really rigorous studies um, looking at uh, sort of cortisol versus uh, cortical density. Um, but you're certainly managing stress, uh, and you know, from, to a core feature, I think that meditation practices are attention training. You know, focus of attention, flexibility of attention, awareness, insight, stability of attention. These are all what meditation does, and it makes you less reactive, and it makes you less you know, uh, um, pushed around by your thoughts to some extent. In regards to meditation, are there minimums or best practices to ensure this the fact that I keep the parts of my brain that I want, basically. Right. There are no, there are no minimums. You know, a minimum is a great way to sort of scare yourself off of doing it. Uh, um, I think key to success of the effect of meditation, the gains, is the regularity with which you do it. Um, and if that's only five minutes every morning, you know, then make it five minutes every morning or every other morning or every, you know, morning and every evening. I, I think that a lot of the, the benefits, if you look at the research and extrapolate the amount of meditation people have done, um, or even the changes sometimes that happen in a few weeks, it probably isn't necessary to meditate all that much in one sitting. Uh, and if you could manage, you know, 15, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, something like that, uh, I think you're you're extremely uh, likely to get to garner all the benefits that have been shown from meditation if you can do 20 minutes on a daily basis. So I know in the company that you founded, or is it a do you call it a company or organization? Alternatives. Alternative Behavioral Health. Yeah, Alternatives is a um, it's a it's a company. Okay. It's a it's a, a service company. Um, in in contrast to True Brain, which makes products, I sort of you know helped launch two you know, within within weeks. The two companies were, were were launching at the same time, essentially. Yeah. Uh, well, and I, I definitely want to get into True Brain in a minute. What I want to talk about with Alternatives is I know you do a lot of the mindfulness, behavioral health, alternative ways of of really uh, making the mind a better place and the, and the brain stronger. Are there certain types of meditation or, or types of practices that you mm -hmm. recommend? Because I feel like most people, especially those listening to the podcast, are the type of people that are out there really working hard. The stress sure. comes along with that. And so what can they do from that perspective? Yeah. And then we'll get into the you know nutrient and nootropics and all that, that, that perspective. Sure. Sure. So, you know, the, the, the EEG technology, the QEG and neurofeedback is really exciting stuff, but it's pretty high tech and it's not always accessible uh, in terms of finding someone to do it and the expense. Um, mindfulness, meditation, it's free. You always got the tools you need with you at any one point in time. Uh, and it almost doesn't matter which form you do. Uh, that being said, I do recommend, I teach people to do a basic practice uh, initially that will have some just basic concentration and then some awareness or open focus uh, uh, practices. Um, I get asked a lot, you know, uh, by people who might be new to meditation who aren't necessarily my clients because they get, you know, direct instruction. Um, you know, I, I want to learn how to meditate. Where should I go? So uh, there's a, a short little one-page how-to uh, on, on Alternatives website. The alternativesbraininstitute.com has a um, don't just uh, do something, sit there uh, <laughs> uh, instruction for 20 minutes. And it's five minutes of a focus meditation, um, classically, historically called samatha. Uh, or a single point awareness, and you you know focus on a single point for five minutes, and whenever you notice you've drifted, you bring your attention back to that point. Um, and then after that, your attention tends to be a bit more stable after those first five minutes. So I have people switch to an awareness uh, meditation, uh, classically called vipassana or um, present time awareness. So some stabilization for five minutes, and then for about fifteen minutes, do a an awareness or an insight or. Uh, present time awareness meditation. And those two together are pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Um, the goal of meditation, as I actually outlay in my little tutorial, is uh, it, it, the, the goal is not to have a blank mind. I have um, one teacher uh, who refers to this goal as Zen masturbation. Um, <laughs> uh, the goal is not, and, and, and you're not doing it wrong if you can't get there. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a trap. The goal of meditation is to notice when you've drifted away from what you've chosen to focus on and then to return your mind to the focus. And that can be a single point or, or narrow focus or a wide focus or watching the breath or watching a sound rise and fall or picking one voice out of many 
uh, like you know, in an orchestra, you know, one instrument. Um, it doesn't really matter, but whenever you notice that you're thinking, planning, dreaming, distracted, noticing aches and pains, whatever it is you've chosen uh, to focus on is no longer the object of your attention, you bring it back to be the object of your attention. And that, that, that's the rep. That's like going to the gym and mm-hmm. banging out one rep of redirecting your attention, hmm. letting go your, your distraction and bringing it back. And it doesn't take, you know, it seems deceptively simple and it's not that uh, hard to do. The instructions can get more complicated, but you know, that little basic instruction will probably give you really all you would ever need. If, if that's all you ever learned, that'd be fine. Uh, and that for you know, 15, 20 minutes every morning will be boring and a little hard and a little a bit annoying for a few days. And at some point, a week or two in, uh, you will start noticing some changes in how you respond to stress and in the space potentially between your thoughts. There is a space there, ideally. Um, and if you haven't found the space between your thoughts, you might want to look into it. Yeah, it's almost like what you said earlier on. It's that separation between the brain and the mind. I think when you are able to see your thoughts for what they are, just passing, fleeting, yeah. sometimes nonsensical, they're not grounded, it makes a big difference in the way you approach them and how they trigger your reaction. It really does. I, mean, I work with a lot of clients who are dealing with a lot of stressors, of course. Uh, and I, I tell them, you know, part of my goal with mindfulness instruction, with neurofeedback is, um, it, you know, it, it appears, especially in anxiety and things like that, it appears like your thoughts are having you. It's time to help, you know, you have your thoughts again. Mm. Um, well, because I... the thoughts should, should uh, to some extent, be under our control. You know, they shouldn't run and race and direct our attention and uh, make us feel stuck and, and ruminative and, and stressed out all the time. If, if we aren't happy in the moment, if we're you know, fuming or seething or uh, anxious or upset, those are states we can change. Um, we just have to learn how and teach the brain how to often. Absolutely. Well, and that's a topic for another show. I do want to have you on to discuss really training the brain and really changing from those sometimes self-defeating thoughts and to really get out there. Because again, for I, I saw it most when I started to do entrepreneurial things, everything's scary. And every step of the way, you are learning something new that you don't know and you're bad at. And those <laughs> thoughts just, they keep coming harder yeah. and faster and larger. And so how to deal with them, I'm still learning. I've made it this far, but something for another show. Because okay. I definitely want to talk about Think Drinks and mm, what sure you guys way. are doing yeah. there. First, let's talk about this. What is a nootropic? Because it's a the true brain. So the, the let's see, true brain is the name of one of the think drinks, right? True brain is the company name. Okay, there you go. Um, and they make a a, a, a capsule based nootropic compound blend. And in tr- nootropic is a it can be one of a number of things. It can be a supplement, uh, a synthetic chemical, an herb, an amino acid. Um, and in general, nootropic means a, a compound that helps cognition in some way, is often neuroprotective against damage or stress, both in short and long term. And, and to some extent, most importantly, it has no side effects or should have almost no or, or very manageable side effects. Caffeine would almost fit the nootropic label if it wasn't for the side effects. They're a little too egregious to sort of allow it to be called a nootropic. You know, there can be some cardiac side effects, habit forming. Um, you know, it's a bit diuretic, appetite suppressant. Those are all potentially too severe, to, uh, I would say, to put something in the nootropic category. Wow. So you're, saying, you're yeah. saying that coffee has actually more side effects than what people call a nootropic? For the most part, yeah. Wow. There's, wow. There, you really shouldn't be getting side effects from, from nootropics. In fact, they're often not felt in, in a way that even stimulants or you know, coffee or other things are. And, and the goal is not to get altered or to feel different on them. The goal is to feel like yourself, but more so hmm. often, or, or, to feel, or to be able to push yourself to focus, to attend, and to stay in a flow state longer, and to stay functioning later into the day, and with a decreased stress, maybe improve your sleep, um, uh, maybe function at a slightly higher output, you know, noticing more things, uh, seeing more patterns, uh, finding words more easily. Uh, these are all the goals of people taking nootropics. Memory and attention goals, for the most part, is what, is what they tend to support. Um, although there are some others that are about more stress and mood support as well. 
Uh, and that was help cognition too, of course. So now can you tell me the science behind it in kind of layman's terms? How does it work? How do, how do we take these? Are they synthetic? Are they found in nature? You know, I'm always a, a little worried about trying yeah. something else out or something new. Right. So there's lots of things we call nootropics. Um, the, the sort of one class of substances that has emerged over the past uh, several decades. And the first one that was synthesized uh, it is synthetic. Um, it was produced uh, many years ago, and it's called paracetam. And since then, there have been many other uh, things in this class synthesized from it. Initially, uh, I believe paracetam was synthesized from the neurotransmitter GABA as a very similar structure, although it, it doesn't appear to be actively binding to GABA receptors necessarily. But it, it had this initial similar uh, natural start, if you will, and then became a synthetic class. And from then, from, from the first uh, racetam, uh, paracetam, uh, there's been several others synthesized, other five or six versions over the, the past several decades. Uh, and then there's lots in, of other random chemicals, and you're right. You, you know, you're right to be skeptical and, and uh, a bit concerned about taking lots of random powders and chemicals. There's lots of what we call research chemicals out there that show promise in animal tests or show promise based on some theory or some you know uh, small uh, experience, but without safety or efficacy studies and without any real history of use. Um, the racetam, certainly paracetam, and some of the more common ones like oxyracetam. Uh, aniracetam, have been used for decades in uh, most countries except for this one. Uh, it's you know, newer to be in this country in the past few years. Um, but the history of safety for the race of TAMs is very, very good. They're, they're dramatically safe. Um, the, the, the joke that uh, I think we put in an infographic on TrueBrain's site somewhere is that the LD50 uh, of TrueBrain, now the LD50 is um, it's a safety rating in, uh, or toxic, a toxicity rating in, in chemistry that says if you feed uh, animals a dose of some compound, at what level will about half of them die? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a how much is poison uh, rating. And True Brain's rating is significantly lower than salt. <laughs> so hmm. you'd have to take you have to take significantly more True Brain uh, than salt to, for it to be toxic. I mean, grams and grams of it would be safe. Uh, of 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 paracetam, which is one of the main ingredients in True Brain. Sorry, I didn't uh, didn't specify. So yeah, to to, uh, to to make it clear, I know you've mentioned Think Drinks and True Brain. True Brain's the company. The capsule product that contains several compounds, including paracetam, is also called True Brain. <laughs> and then there's a new product, which is a drink, a small little one ounce uh, um, box of drinks that uh is called the think drink okay. so it's it's true brain in a drink form gotcha uh is the think drink and it's be, and the reason we named it that think drink is because it's not an energy drink and it's not really you know it's not going up against five hour energy or monster or rock star it's sort of you know not going against coffee either it's it's uh trying to do a convenience play and also really help people get uh, access to nootropics maybe absorbed a little bit faster more conveniently um, and help them, uh, and this is true of both capsules and the, the drinks, help people you know, pick ingredients without having to sort of figure out if they're looking at a big long list of research chemicals or looking at a list of safe ingredients. Uh, for True Brain, we chose mostly um, amino acids and herbal ingredients, except for paracetam. We've got some paracetam, of course, um, a choline source, magnesium, some L-tyrosine to help the dopamine system, uh, some acetyl L-carnitine, um, L-theanine, which is an amino acid in tea leaves that's very calming, um, some omega-3 fatty acids from algae. I mean, all, all pretty solid, safe ingredients. And I think this is the name of the game when it comes to venturing into territory where you're not trying to remediate a specific problem, but you're trying to gain something, you know, gain uh, stability over many, many years, gain some day-to-day uh, -day improvements in focus and attention and cognition. If that's your goal, you shouldn't be going for the riskiest things because the gains are small here. Um, but they can be, you know, very telling for you individually and can be very noticeable and, and, and can help, uh, potentially in this, in this class of, of substances. I mean, this is why I got into it. And for me, it ended up being, uh, um, at least as effective a support to attention and focus and out sustained output, um, as something like uh, a stimulant like Adderall. But without the push of the stimulant and without all the side effects. Mm. Yeah, uh, so. that, that was one of the things I wanted to ask you because energy drinks are something I never got into. That the, Those things are just outrageous. But coffee, I never drank coffee. I always thought it was disgusting all through college. Get uh, to my first job, start drinking coffee, and that stuff is awesome. 
Like, I mean, oh my God. Like, I mean, when it really gets, gets me going. Now I do have the crash and then I either have to get, you know, tough my way through it or have another cup. But, but I like sometimes that feeling of, I mean, I get going and I get work done and I zone and all the things that people for hundreds and uh, hundreds of years have been drinking coffee for. Do you get that kind of feeling or is it more, it takes a little while? Like you try this stuff for longer? Yeah, it takes a little while. Um, Paracetam appears to affect uh, cell membranes and other features in the cell. Um, Acetylcarnitine is affecting some energy output. Um, It does sort of emerge over several days um, until you sort of have the full effects after about a week or two for most people. But, you know, it's, it also, once you have that effect, uh, a single dose will often be sort of gently felt. But it's sure. very clear. It's sort of like, you know, I, I, I joke it's like someone comes by and squeegees the world and things are a little <laughs> bit clearer. That's a great, um, that's a great analogy. Know? So right. it's, a, it's just a little easier to look around, a little easier to process information. Words are, you know, closer to the tip of your tongue, not quite so digging for them. Uh, so uh, for me, anyways, um, it's a pretty good mix. But yeah. The other question I have for you was how much of these things do we get if we eat a balanced diet full of vegetables, yeah. fruit? It's certainly important and, and really the, the fats, the good quality fats are key there for brain health. But you know, we're, we're just not going to get things like uh, specialized forms of choline sure. that might have you know, very unique effects in the cell or paracetam or you know, um, we might not get a lot of L-tyrosine or uh, – you know, um, not a lot of L-theanine unless we're drinking huge amounts of, of, of tea. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I don't think the average person will be able to get these amounts. Certainly not, you know, unless you're eating a slab of fish every night, you're not getting huge amounts of DHA mm-hmm. either. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so I, I don't think it's possible to supplement, sorry, to, to do this without uh, extra or uh, extraneous sources of these things to some extent. Sure. Hopefully you guys are sending over, I think, a uh, a little trial. And I'm really excited. Great. I, I want to try it out. And what you said about kind of bringing things to the forefront quicker, f- recalling things better. I mean, I notice it very much in podcasting specifically. So uh-huh. when I'm stressed out, I've had a tough day. And much of what I do is off the cuff. It's just conversations, things I want to learn. Sure. Man, you can really see one day to the next. Wow, I felt on right there. I mean, questions right. are just coming. And to other days, it's a struggle. Or I, I joke with my wife, we watch Jeopardy almost every night. And some nights I'm like, damn, I am really smart. And then other <laughs> nights they're there and it's so frustrating. And That's so right. I'm going to, I'm going to try the Jeopardy challenge okay, and, so. and see where this comes out, but I'm excited. And, uh, you know, I appreciate the fact that they brought somebody like yourself in and you guys really have, it's apparent, you know, try to do your best to bring the science to it. I read the article about the day traders and really looking at how brain waves work and, and if these, um, nootropics can help with life. Thanks. Now, and more to come on our research uh, over the next year or two as we ha- you know, unveil. We're, we're, True Brain's a small company still in spite of you know, having a, a great product. So uh, as we grow, more research comes out of that too. So uh, it's sort of an uh, enlightened self-interest if you use True Brain. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much uh, for being on the show. I really appreciate it. It's TrueBrain.com. And then where can our listeners go to find uh, alternatives? Yeah, AlternativesBH.com. BH, alternativesbh.com. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Well, I know you got to go because you got another call coming up. I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll stay in touch and hopefully we'll have you on again soon. Thanks, Chris. My pleasure. Look forward to talking to you again. All right. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Welcome back. I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation with Dr. Andrew Hill. If you have questions about True Brain, you should reach out to Chris. I believe he is testing out the product but just as a reminder our friends at true brain are offering twenty dollars off a fifty dollar trial kit you only have to use the offer code smart 20 or use our link truebrain.com slash smart people just a reminder as we enter the holiday season please continue to use our amazon banner on the top of our page at smartpeoplepodcast.com or you can use our direct affiliate link smartpeoplepodcast.com slash amazon a portion of each of your purchases actually gets kicked back to us at no cost to you and it's a huge help to the show so we greatly appreciate those of you who have done it throughout the year and especially during this holiday season hope you guys have a good one and we'll see you next week (laughs) 